All right. So first, I wanted to thank uh, Peter and Alex and the organizers for the invitation for my collaborators and I to speak. It's a real honor. Uh, so today, uh, I guess we're going to get to the sort of end of the sort of main mission, which is to sort of produce explicit examples of full profinitely rigid groups. And uh, I guess I'm tasked with taking the machinery and the, the results from the second lecture and translating it into this world of just PSL2. And, uh, you know, the main sort of focus are gonna, going to be very special kinds of arithmetic lattices in PSL2R and PSL2C that, that are gonna satisfy all the conditions we need in order to even get started with our uh, approach to profinite rigidity. So with that, let me get started. Oh yeah, this, this first part of the talk uh, is not going to get to the rigidity. Uh, it's my job to sort of set things up so that Alan can then sort of explain the sort of, the sort of reasons and such. So <clears throat> I wanted to do a sort of quick overview of the previous lecture. So we have, uh, we saw the, in the last lecture that if we have two finitely generated groups, uh, gamma and delta, that uh, have isomorphic profinite completions, then there's a bijection between the bounded representations of these groups. And in, in maybe the simplest terms, remember these bounded representations are ones that extend to the profinite completion. Uh, and so in this sort of bijection of the arithmetic data, the arithmetic data that Ryan spoke about in the second lecture that we can attach to these representations this sort of data is equivalent locally. Uh, but without sort of any additional representation on gamma or delta, um, you know, this is just formal. I mean, and, and really impossible to explicitly use. Uh, so today we're gonna discuss this for, for certain kinds of arithmetic Fuchsian inclining groups. Um, the arithmetic condition, you know, is really, really needed. Uh, but also more than just arithmeticity, we're gonna need them to satisfy some list of conditions. Uh, and we're gonna require mostly here uh, that these, or we're gonna require that these lattices be Galois rigid, um, plus additional conditions on their arithmetic data. So <clears throat> just a kind of quick review of what arithmetic lattices in PSL2 and PSL2 over R and C uh, come from. Um, We'll just sort of briefly review this. So uh, every arithmetic lattice in PSL2R is commensurable with uh, the group of norm one elements uh, of some maximal order inside some quaternion algebra defined over a totally real number field. Uh, now, in order for this to be a lattice in PSL2R, we, we require that this algebra B be unramified at exactly one real place of the field K. And similarly, the, the lattices in PSL2C come from these norm one groups uh, of maximal orders, again, up to commensurability uh, inside a quaternion algebra defined over a number field now with exactly one place. And uh, in order for this to be a lattice in PSL2C, we require that B be uh, ramified over every real place. Uh, over C, of course, it cannot, <laughs> it's, it splits. Uh, so this K, this number field K and this quaternion algebra B, these are these sort of invariant trace field invariant quaternion algebra of the lattice that were sort of discussed in the previous lecture. So now it's for sort of producing a sort of representation. So we're gonna assume that we're starting off with this group gamma, it's some arithmetic lattice and PSL2R or C with some associated field and quaternion algebra K and B. So for simplicity, we're gonna assume that uh, gamma is actually uh, derived. So it lives inside one of these norm one groups. And we're also going to assume that this gamma is Galois rigid uh, or PSL2C Galois rigid. And so remember, this just means that, you know, <clears throat> there's, there's, you know, you have the discrete faithful representation or the realization as a lattice and all other Zariski dense representations 
are just going to be Galois conjugates to this one. And now we're going to assume, I guess to stick with the theme that we found some group in the gutter delta uh, that's finitely generated and residually finite and it has the same profinite completion as delta. And so what we wanna do ultimately is produce a homomorphism from delta to gamma. So that's like what we want to do most so that then we can get into a setting where we can use all of this sort of hyperbolic geometry to sort of then sort of close the deal. Um, so <clears throat> here we're, we're going to assume that the gamma and delta are as above. And so then the, the theorem, and so this is a specialization of the this, this sort of results from lecture two that Ryan gave. So here there exists some number field K prime, some uh, quaternion algebra B prime and some maximal order inside of it, uh, such that we have a Zariski dense representation phi prime going from our gutter group delta to the group of norm one elements in this, this order O prime. I, I can't hear you, Alex. May I ask you just uh, to clarify something for myself and maybe to add for the audience because, um, I mean, uh, this situation is actually a little bit more complicated for, from the higher rank groups that we think about usually, like in SLN Z, the group gamma B SLN Z is kind of trivially Galois rigid, right? So we basically, the previous results gave us that the abstract uh, profinite rigidity boils down to a Grotendieck type of uh, problem for SLNZ, right? So basically yes. what you are showing us that, uh, uh, that these groups, which are kind of, it was, when I saw your paper, it was a surprise for me that even though they don't have global rigidity, they have a very small local rigidity, and you are using this in order to reduce to the Gothendieck uh, problem, right? I mean, uh, yes, this, yes, a, a, a fair description. Okay, so under this uh, Galois rigidity, you say that we don't need the full rigidity, just this, this specific representation. Okay. Yeah, and, and again, just to maybe emphasize here that just under the conditions that we stated above, there's some K prime, some B prime, and some O prime. Uh, it's not necessarily the K, the B, and the O that give rise to gamma. Uh, another thing, maybe just as an aside, that so in at the end of the day, we're going to produce these profinitely rigid groups. And one of the things I find most remarkable about this is I don't really know that much about the profinite completions of these, these lattices that we're showing are rigid. The, the sort of miracle is that we only need the PSL2 rep theory in order to distinguish this amongst all the groups. It's like, it's PSL2 rep theory is so special uh, for these just remarkable examples that, that, that you can get the rigidity without knowing really that much about the completion itself. So there is something which is mysterious to me, I must say. I, 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 I'm not sure I sent to you, but I sent, after the previous lecture, I sent an email uh, to Brian and I pointed out to him that inside SL3Z, you have different congruent samples which are not isomorphic, but still the profile of completions are are uh, isomorphic to each other. So in a way, when we say we want SL3Z to be profinitely rigid, it's a delicate issue. It's only for the full group and it's not going to be true for finite index subgroups. Here, it looks to me like you are not requiring that gamma will be the full group or at some point you, are, you said that gamma is inside this uh, uh, oh, wow. Yeah, so so all of this just for these results that I'm stating, we only require, you don't even require the gamma be finite index. If gamma is in O1, so going back to the previous slide, if gamma is just in O1, is Galois rigid, then you get exactly the same statement. Like you don't actually use arithmeticity. 
specifically here. You're just using that you live inside something arithmetic. So just to be clear, Alex, you know, we just get a representation. We have no idea to start with what the image is. We have no idea what the kernel is. And then the other thing is the miracle that happens is that we use the, this kind of PSL2C Galois rigidity to get this representation, but then the low dimensional topology and geometry kicks in when we know we're inside these groups. So we really do use a lot more machinery after we've built the representation. So if I, 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 I'm, I'm, what, what I keep in my mind all the time, what can I take from your argument to the case I'm really interested, which is SL3Z? So basically you are telling me that if I take a finite index sum in SL3Z, by the machinery up to now, I will only know that I can have a three-dimensional representation of it, and maybe even to SL3Z, but not to the, a, a delta is not a subgroup of gamma. That's what you are telling me, right? Yes, this, but I, I would say in this representation, if you take a finite index subgroup of SL3Z uh, and, and then you apply this machinery to that, then the mystery group is going to map to SL3Z and you'll know what its, its congruence closure is. So you, you, you'll know, you can see its congruence closure, but Again, as you point out, if you have two subgroups inside of SL2Z that have the same profinite completion, you so wouldn't know which one of those two groups you are mapping to. So it's not going to be the same congruent closure as gamma. That's, that's the problem. Right. You are not right. reduced to the Gotten D question in this situation. Right. Okay. We need some more. Okay. I, I'm waiting. Okay. To we'll see what is the more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just to kind of restate the sort of theorem I just wanted to state, uh, yes, there's more. So the, in this sort of result, we, we know that the, this delta, this gutter group is Galois rigid, or PSL2C Galois rigid. Uh, we know that there's a bijection between the embeddings of K and K prime into QP bar, including the Archimedean. And, and this gives a bijection between their places as well for every P such that under this bijection, the two number fields have isomorphic uh, uh, completions. So they're arithmetically equivalent or even better, they have isomorphic and del rates. Uh, we also know that if you take the, the algebra B for gamma and the one B prime for delta, when you tensor those over these completions, uh, the bijected completions that these, these algebras are isomorphic. And, and, and maybe just to sort of point out that there are only finitely many possibilities up to isomorphism for this K prime, B prime, and O prime. Uh, so a few additional remarks. <clears throat> you know, without any more with assumptions on the arithmetic data, you can't determine which, which of these things. Like there are examples where there is a K prime, B prime, and O prime. Uh, and, and that just happens and you don't know, I mean, you don't know if you're going to K or K prime. Uh, and yeah, we can't say anything about the image or kernel of this phi prime uh, uh, without additional assumptions. Um, and yeah, as I noted, arithmeticity isn't needed in this. You just need to be kind of sub-arithmetic, Zariski dense. So I guess like a, it would work for like a thin group uh, if it were Galois rigid, of course. Uh, and so now our main goal is to, to sort of determine when we can actually prove that at least this arithmetic data is the same. And in, when that holds and gamma, so here's where we use the arithmeticity. So when we know that these, the, this sort of the K, the B and the O are determined and gamma is arithmetic, then this representation is gonna have image contained in a lattice commensurable to gamma. Uh, so again, not, it's not quite, you, you can't without additional assumptions know if it's gonna go to gamma or, or something commensurable to it. Uh, and so now we're gonna try to focus on, on conditions when we can, can, can get this sort of main thing here, the, the, the data to, to be isomorphic. So for this, we're, we need a definition uh, for our quaternion algebra. So we're gonna say it's locally uniform 
if for any two piatic places, V and V prime, that are, have isomorphic completions, this algebra when you tensor over these two different completions uh, are isomorphic. So it has the same behavior uh, over all the, the places of the same kind of local completion type. Uh, so <clears throat> as a corollary with a gamma and delta as, as in the, the statement of our theorem, uh, if K is Galois or has one complex place, then we know that uh, it's arithmetically rigid. So anything that's got the same Thetic and Zeta function as it must be isomorphic to it. Uh, and if, so now if the fields are isomorphic and on top of that, K has at most one real place and B is locally uh, uh, uniform, then we're gonna say that B and B prime, then B and B prime must be isomorphic. Uh, and so if K is imaginary quadratic, this is Galois, so we know that it's, it's arithmetically rigid and B is split, so uh, matrices, no ramification, and then we know that the field and the algebras will be uh, isomorphic. And uh, maybe another one that is a bit more specific, but you'll see why, if K is degree three with one real place and B is ramified uh, at, uh, at one of the real places, and uh, a unique, so a, a unique piatic place of a given norm, then uh, the fields are isomorphic again uh, by this because it's only one complex place, and uh, the B would then be uh, locally uniform under these conditions, and so the B and B prime would be isomorphic. So <clears throat> now we see in this sort of previous situation that. Uh, that when the B and the B prime are isomorphic, now we have a map from delta to the norm one elements. But again, <clears throat> this is, you know, there need not be a unique maximal order. And so, uh, you know, we know our gamma is contained in some maximal order, but B could have other maximal orders. Uh, and so we wouldn't know a priori which one it, it mapped to, the delta. We just know that it would map to one of these orders. So here are two examples uh, of, of things that sort of satisfy these conditions. So the first one is we're gonna take Q adjoins A to three, third root of unity. We're gonna take the split algebra two by two matrices. And uh, we're gonna take, you know, the standard maximal order. And so uh, this lattice uh, PSL2 O sub K is remarkable in that it's Galois rigid. Uh, so this is a very, very, very special Bianchi group. Uh, it, so then if you, so, you know, the quaternion algebra, this quaternion algebra B has unique maximal order uh, up to conjugation. And so in this situation, when we have this field and this order and this algebra, and this is our group, we get a map five prime going from delta to gamma. Uh, this example, the first example is the Galois rigid. This is. It is. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Now, why this is the Galois rigid? This group, the PSL two, okay. Well, I, I mean, I don't know, Alan. Are you going to discuss that much? I'll discuss that. Yeah. Okay, Alan's going to discuss that. I mean, again, <clears throat> it's not an easy thing to establish that something's Galois rigid, and it's. It's, you know, just finding ones you can, it's, it's already hard in terms of that task. And, and again, on top of it, we need the arithmetic data to satisfy all the stuff I had in the previous slides in order for us to win. Uh, yeah. Are you using its class number one yet? Uh, well, I mean, here it's, I mean, B has a unique maximal order. So, I mean, that comes into play as to why this B has unique maximal order. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's one thing that's special about K. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, class number one implies all maximal orders are conjugate, you know. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. So the next example is, is going to be one that satisfies this sort of second, second slide or the second part condition. So here we're going to take a cubic extension uh, where it satisfies this equation. 
And so this field has one complex place, two reals, and then we're gonna take a quaternion algebra that's ramified at uh, the unique real place. Sorry, I said two real places, I meant one. It has one complex place of the conjugation and one real place. So then we take this quaternion algebra that's ramified at the unique real place uh, and also the unique five attic place of norm five. Uh, and so this, that, that algebra is locally uniform by construction. Um, and this arithmetic lattice, when you look at the, the norm one elements inside uh, this max, oh, I should have said uh, that this, this, this algebra also has unique maximal order. And so, uh, and this thing's sort of Galois rigid. So then uh, we get that this delta again maps to this gamma in this particular place, place, case. Uh, and again, just to emphasize like, why is this Galois rigid? You have to check. I mean, you, you know, there's no obvious reason why this is Galois rigid from the arithmetic that I've, we're, we're giving you here. I mean, it's, it's again, a very special lattice. Uh, it's, and that's the thing. These are very special lattices. I'll kind of give the rundown on the Fuchsian side. Uh, and we'll also discuss, uh, and so here, uh, we're going to assume B is ramified at exactly one real place and uh, one piatic place that, again, is determined by its completion. So if B is ramified at the other real place. These two algebras aren't isomorphic over K, but you still have a map from B to B prime. And so th there's not really an ambiguity. And so we'll just stick with the case of the, you know, the first one, the B. And so again, we're going to take our gamma to be an O1 uh, for some maximal order in B. And again, we're going to assume that gamma is Galois rigid and B has unique maximal order up to conjugation. Then we get again um, that delta is Galois rigid, and we have this map phi prime going to the O1 group. So I want to discuss two, ex two explicit examples, or really just the hyperbolic triangle groups. Uh, so first, co-compact triangle groups, one nice thing about them is that they are PSL2C rigid, uh, but there's infinitely many of them that are Galois rigid, and there's also infinitely many that are not Galois rigid. Uh, so Galois rigidity isn't something that holds for all of them. Um, additionally, very few triangle groups are defined over real quadratic number of fields, and only finitely many are arithmetic. And so we, we need the trace field to, to be at most real quadratic. Uh, and so here are some winners. Uh, the first one was uh, discussed at the very beginning of the first lecture. Martin uh, mentioned this 334 triangle group. So this has trace field uh, Q adjoint square root of two and the invariant quaternion algebra is ramified at one real place of the unique place over two. And just another one is the triangle group 355. So this has trace field Q adjoint square root of five and the uh, invariant quaternion algebra is ramified again at one real place and the unique place over three. Uh, so that's all I have for the first part of the talk. Uh, the second part, we get to see all the magic come together. So let me stop sharing. So this Galois rigidity in these examples is really just uh, an analysis of the quaternion algebras and aspects of it, right? Of these are... No, like the, the Galois rigidity for these is 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 very specific. I mean, oh, you're saying for no, the no, triangle I'm saying what comes into it is this uh, analysis of the lattice that the norm one lattice and some extra properties that maybe Alan will explain how you get the rigidity, but it's all, um, yeah, it's just about quaternion algebras and some, something about them that we'll hear. Yes. Just trying to understand that part, yeah. Uh, and our group, the image phi, the, the image of delta, phi prime or whatever you call it, is potentially not commensurable to this group. Right. And you're going to show how we're going to get commensurability from topology or something. Okay. Okay.
Out of the gutter. <laughs> it's become the thing. <laughs> Yes, so um, getting back to uh, Martin's lecture where we started with um, some groups in the gutter that were had the same profile at completion of lattices that we may care about. The task today for the rest of the lecture is to actually get out of the gutter and you know polish these groups up a little bit and actually find that they're little diamonds that there they are completely determined by their Profinite completion, or, or more prosaically, their list of finite quotients. So, the, my task is to, to get us out of the gutter. Uh, and, and being Scottish, of course, I'm very happy to be down in the gutter and I'm happy to climb out of it and, and do what needs to be done to, to show a little bit about Galois rigidity and what we do to do some explicit computations and to emphasize to prove Galois rigidity, it pretty much needs some explicit computations that you need to get down and dirty with. And the special features of some of these quaternion algebras, etc., that Ben had mentioned before. Okay, so um, here is the three, three, four triangle group that Ben has discussed, and Martin had this fine picture at the start of the lecture series. And again, just to reiterate some of what Ben said, that this is an arithmetic triangle group, and it's a very beautiful arithmetic triangle group. So. Geometrically, here's the picture of the tessellation of the, the disk. The quaternion algebra is defined over Q root two, and that is the trace field of this triangle group. The ramified finite place is the prime corresponding to the square root of two in this number field. And again, maybe just to kind of say something, the, the crucial thing you see is that once you're kind of ramified at a particular finite place, this says something about the, the pro p completion of this order that everything's going on in and that's distinct from kind of the pro p completion of something that's made uh, that's something that's locally matrix so in one sense when we see the ramified place that's giving us a local division algebra and that's a different kind of bounded representation from going into the two by two matrices over that local field so being ramified gives us local information and having a small degree like two then says that once we know we have this kind of bounded representation from the ramified place that forces by quaternion algebra this real place that's non-identity to be ramified and that's kind of a little bit of magic that's used to guarantee that we get this um yeah machine to work in this kind of setting now moreover this triangle group actually occurs on the nose as the image of elements of norm one in a maximal order in this quaternion algebra. So over in the geometric world, here's this nice picture of the tessellation. Over in the algebra world, there's this quaternion algebra over a field and it spits out the unit group of a maximal order. And by good fortune, um, the image of this unit group of a maximal order is on the nose, this triangle group. So from the point of view of what Ben was talking about, we have this representation that's built in now, once we have Galois rigidity, that's going back into the unit group of this maximal order. Now, as we've just said, this maximal order is the triangle group. So that we view as a positive. So we've got the situation now from Ben that if we've got this guy in the gutter with the same profile at completion as this triangle group, then we get the representation that the representation rigidity stuff gives us. And it now gives us a homomorphism into the triangle group with some large image. Now, again, to emphasize, we have no idea right now what this image group L looks like. And the goal is to show that L equals delta. Because then once we have L equals delta, delta is isomorphic to lambda hat, we get the epimorphism at the pro-finite level onto L hat, which is delta hat, and then the Hopfian property kicks in to show that lambda is isomorphic to delta. So where we bring to bear so the techniques from, you know, grubbing around in the gutter and low dimensional topology and geometry is to show that the only possibility for L is that it's delta. So we have got to rule out the possibility that L has finite index and L has infinite index. And this is what we can't do an SL3Z, but we can do here. Alex. 
No, I'm still a bit uh, confused. So in this case, you do show us that you were used to the Gothenburg question. Except no. It's just, a, it's just a representation right now. So the representation rigidity just gives us this image group L. So there it is. I have no idea what it is. It has huge kernels for all we know right now. The only time we know that it's injective is at the very end when we prove. Except on objectivity. But at least we get into a subgroup. Right. Now, we know that the surface group and the angle groups are layer. So once you know that the image is inside delta, you this knows that the image is onto delta, right? Because left. No, no. So all we know about the image is that it's some, it's some subgroup of delta, right? So I mean, it has some of the finite quotients that delta. It has some of the finite quotients that delta has, but it needn't have all of them, of course. It's just some subgroup of the of the group delta. So it so the profinite completion of L, we, we don't know what that is. All we know is that L is a quotient of delta. It has the same congruence topology as as delta. No, it doesn't help you here. All that we know is that L has the same congruence closure as delta. Because you don't understand, because you don't know that the Oceans are coming. Right. So, exactly. So all we see is a little bit of the, the finite quotient, but that's enough using the PSL2F representations to get us into where we want to go in this very, very, very special setup where we have Galois rigidity plus the additional control that Ben described. And, and remember that the image, this image group L, it is Galois rigid. I mean, it's it's PSL two C rigid. So, I mean, you do know that about it. It's you know. Well, we'll come to that in a minute. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> okay, onwards. I'm going to take Alec looking away as a time to move on. Okay, so so here is the statement of those triangle groups that we can prove are, are profinitely rigid, and it's the list that we've given here. There's 14 of them. And uh, as Peter will notice, there's no sign of 237. And again, that's because 237 has got cubic trace field and, it's ram and the algebra is ramified at two real places that we just can't see. So to the eyes of this representation theory world, 237 looks just the same as the Hilbert modular group, PSL2 of the ring of integers of the trace field of 237. So having this ramified prime in low degree is extremely helpful in leveraging the representation theory. So, so these are the triangle groups. And again, I'm the Fuchsian one. So these are the orientation, orientation preserving guys in the triangle and the hyperbolic plane with the interior angles that are specified here. But we can also prove the reflection groups or the coxeter groups associated to these triangle groups are also profinitely rigid. And this is part of a a more general theme that in our situation again, going up often promotes profinite rigidity. Now I say often because there's a cautionary tale because if you cast your mind back to Martin's lecture when he mentions bounce like examples of two groups that were virtually Z that were not profinitely rigid, then there's clearly something to be said about promoting profinitely rigid upwards from something that's known to be profinitely rigid. So here's a picture of the commensurability and the color coding is hopefully meant to explain something useful. So the red is, is, is special is special because the representation rigidity arguments apply directly. And I chose red especially for Peter because that's meant to indicate Manchester United. Uh, I didn't choose any blue for Chelsea. Um, the green audience knows what you're talking about. <laughs> no, they yes, they do. Yeah, we've come a long way, Peter. We've come a long way. And, and the green colors in the top right hand corner of diagram two, that's meant to indicate that the arguments don't apply, i.e., those two triangle groups are not Galois rigid. And you can see that very easily because if you look at 666, for example, that subjects the triangle group to 66. And so there are additional Zariski dense representations that would come from that. On the other hand, if we look at 336, it is Galois rigid, 
But in fact, you'll see that it surjects 333, but that's a Euclidean triangle group. So that's legal. That's not Zariski dense because it's a solvable group. And so the red ones are our rigid. The green ones aren't. This teal colored guy, 2510, is not Galois rigid either, but we can still use our ideas to promote Galois rigidity upwards from 555 to establish Galois rigidity there. And then the ones that are undecorated by any color coding whatsoever, we were able to establish profinite rigidity of these Z2 extensions um, that I talked about. Um, that I, I, I'm not going to be able to say anything about at this point. But that's kind of the scheme of how these guys fit together. As we'll see in a minute, in fact, maybe we'll just go there right now. As was the case of Delta 334, several of these triangle groups on the screen, so 334, 336, 335, 255, and this one here that I can't read now because it's overlapped, 355, the, these actually turn out to be on the nose again the unit groups of maximal orders inside the appropriate quaternion algebras. And again, as Ben was saying, these quaternion algebras are over qu real quadratic fields and ramified at one real place and one finite place. And the information is given here. So the 334 we've seen is ramified at two and then the others are given below here. So that's the crucial information on the screen that allows us to get the representation theory to run. It allows us to build homomorphisms of our fake guy lambda in the gutter back into the unit group of the maximal order, which by a miracle turns out to be the triangle group in this case. For the case of 444 and 555, um, there are subgroups of these triangle groups, 334 and um, whatever the other one was. But again, we can handle those fairly easily to see that the image group in these case, even though it starts off just going back into the unit group of the maximal order, a simple-minded calculation shows you actually have to be back inside the triangle group delta again. And so then again, it gets down to, we need to prove that the image group L is equal to delta using some additional structure that's built in from the theory of Fuchsian groups in this case. Okay, so as good luck would have it, you know, here's, a, here's an illustration of Galois rigidity. And it's, it's very dear to my heart because you just have to get down and dirty and do the calculation. Okay, so what does it mean to be Galois rigid? We have to analyze the representations of this group into PSL2C. Okay, so here's 334. Let's just do that one. Well, what can happen when we have a representation of this triangle group? Well, um, A, B, and A, B have got to go to elements of finite order dividing three, three, and four respectively. Uh, so then, well, all right, this representation at this point, are you assuming it's discrete? No, I'm just, it's just some representation right now, Peter. Okay. It's just, a, so a representation, just a homomorphism. So the elements okay. have to go to elements dividing the order of three, three, and four. If it's order one, well, it's easy to see. If you kill A, that kills the group. If you kill B, that kills the group. If you kill A, B, well, the image is abelian. And so that's not the risky dense. Okay, well, that, that means A and B go to elements of order three. That's good. Well, A, B could have the misfortune to map to an element of order two. But then what do we see? Well, that's the two, three, three triangle group, which is just A4. And so that's not the risky dense. So we can forget about that. So what we've decided is um, if there's a risky dense representation, the images of A and B have order three, and the image of A, B has order four. And now we're mapping into PSL2C. So again, I'll abuse notation and just think of matrices, but you know, simple-minded analysis of um, Mobius transformations means we can conjugate. We don't really care about representations after all. It's really just you know, the number of characters we're caring about. And so the image of A looks like this and the image of B looks like this where omega is a cube root of unity. Now the product has order four and that forces a condition on what this two one entry R looks like. And very quickly, we see that the only possibilities for R are given by these two solutions, one plus or minus root two. And so the only PSL2C representations we see occur, to these, occur for these two solutions of R. And that's precisely the faithful discrete representation 
and the ramified place representation that goes into PSU2. So that's kind of what one has to do typically to prove Galois rigidity. Just get in there and, and do the dirty work. Okay, so let's turn to the, the three-dimensional case now, the Kleinian group case. And then there are several arithmetic Kleinian groups that are profoundly rigid. And again, to emphasize something Ben said, all we can ever do is arithmetic things. We, we don't know what to do if things are non-arithmetic. And so, um, you know, two groups that are, are dear to my heart and perhaps even to, dear to a few people's heart in the audience are, are, are these groups, PSL2, Zia, Joan, Omega, and the PGL2 version of this. Now I've drawn these quotient orbifolds. So these groups act on the hyperbolic three space. They're discrete subgroups of PSL2C. The quotient is some finite volume hyperbolic three orbifold. And this picture is meant to indicate what this orbifold looks like schematically. So the quotient is a ball with some singular locus. So we think of triangle groups and we think of spheres with cone points. You can think of this somewhat like that. So what this picture really thinks is it's a ball and the ideal vertex is what you can see in front of you, the three, the three, three, three edges that run out to this boundary, that's really going off an ideal vertex. And so what we see is this orbifold has a cusp cross section that's a Euclidean two orbifold. That's a sphere with three cone points of cone angle two pi over three. And similarly over here for PGL two. Now you may not think that's important, but it's actually vitally important as to why this Bianchi group is so special. So as Ben mentioned, this guy is Galois rigid and the Galois rigidity can really be traced back to the fact that this cusp is a Euclidean triangle orbifold. Any other Bianchi group has a cusp that's more complicated that allows for deformation. So in the Thurston sense, you, know, can, you can perform Dane surgery on the other Bianchi orbifolds, but this guy, you can't. And so in fact, this, this group that was known has property FA of Sir, basically like the triangle groups, it's generated by these elliptic elements of finite order whose products are also finite order. And so you cannot act on a tree with a global, but you cannot act non-trivially on a simplicial tree, you always have a global fixed point. So that at least gives you zero dimensional PSL2C character variety. But in fact, one can prove that, as Ben said, that these guys are actually Galois rigid. And if one way to see this, I mean, one has to do a little bit more thinking through, but in fact, Paluzzi and Zimmerman had analyzed kind of PSL2 FP bar representations of this group and noticed that the only PSL2 F quotients you saw came completely from number theory, i.e. the splitting type of the prime that you were looking at. And this is really a kind of finite shadow of being Galois rigid. You only see the representations that the number theory tells you. And you know, if you had another Zariski dance representation of this Bianchi group, then the strong approximation machine would kick in to give you additional PSL2F representations of that group. That's kind of the reason why this Bianchi group is, is Galois rigid. But That's it is great. Great for, for us who don't know this so well. Uh, so the Picard group, you don't know? Yeah, the Picard group is not Galois rigid. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not Galois rigid. And you say that's no. related to the fact that the cusp is, which is, is uh, got some deformations. That's correct, Peter. If you go to the PGL2 of uh, oh, Zia, no. Joe, and I, I would bet you a fizzy beverage that is profinitely rigid. We haven't written down the details, but uh, you know, if you're prepared to put up a fizzy beverage the next time I visit Princeton, I'll, I'll happily write down the details of that. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, so the, this particular Bianchi group is very special. And again, we're back in the situation now, as Ben mentioned, that this Bianchi group is a projective image of the elements of norm one in the standard maximal order. And so then we get the fake guy going back into the Bianchi group. And again, the task is for us to show that L equals PSL2 Z and Omega. I'm gonna mention quickly a few more examples and then get on to the end game, which is perhaps of most interest right now, maybe at least to Alex. So one of the examples that Ben mentioned was uh, the Weeks manifold. 
So this is a minimal volume closed orientable hyperbolic manifold. And here's a picture of a surgery description. One can compute a presentation. And then from this, we can see the homology is very simple. But again, you know, by brute force and ignorance, one just has to get in there and compute all characters of, of this particular three manifold group into PSL2C. And, and again, one does this, and one sees that we only ever see the faithful discrete representation, complex conjugation of that, and the SU2 representation you get from the ramified place of the invariant quaternion algebra. Okay, so as I mentioned, and as Ben mentioned, that this guy fits the scheme that Ben described before. There's a unique real ramified place, and there's this unique prime of norm five that is the ramified place that allows us to get going here. And maybe just a, just a quick comment that I think Martin and I were particularly amused at. If you recall back to Martin's talk, this field K showed up in his talk because the splitting field of K for this particular cubic was the field capital K that Sir used in his constructions of these algebraic varieties that were um, not the same, but their groups had the same profinite completion. The fundamental groups had the same profinite completion. So I think we were we were quite tickled by the fact that Sir's examples kind of somehow showed up in our, one of our first examples here of these lattices that are profinitely rigid. Okay, so again, the machine that Ben told us about is that if we have the guy in the gutter lambda with the same profinite completion, well, we get a representation that goes back into the unit group of a maximal order. There's only one type, so we can conjugate. In fact, what we see is that the, this weak manifold group is a sub, normal subgroup of index three. So what we know, just by simple-minded nonsense, is that whatever the image group L of this representation is, because the weak manifold has no Z mod three Z quotients, in fact, L has to land up back inside the, the fundamental group of the weak manifold. So now, again, we're reduced to sort of showing that L has to be equal to um, the fundamental group of the Weeks manifold. And it's a simple-minded bit of three-manifold topology using poincare lefschetz duality that says, we're reduced to the finite index case because anything of infinite index in the Weeks manifold has got positive first Betty number. And so whenever you have positive first Betty number, that would show up as a map to Z of L and hence a map to Z from Lambda. But that's impossible because Lambda's got the same profinite completion as the Weeks manifold, which is finite. H1. So there's a little bit of three manifold topology that kicks in to reduce us to the case where, in fact, the image group had finite index inside the Weeks manifold. And then there's a statement there about pushing profinite rigidity upwards, and I won't dwell on it here. Um, there's some new examples that I just thought I mentioned briefly that Martin and I computed. We showed that these two examples, one called Vol3, suggestively, which is the third smallest volume hyperbolic three manifold. And the fourfold cyclic branch cover of the figure eight knot, <coughs> these groups turn out to be profinitely rigid. We, one can show Galois rigidity. And what's cute here is that this F, this fundamental group of the fourfold cyclic branch cover, is the Conway Fibonacci group F28. So here, when M is equal to four. So this guy here is, is profinitely rigid. And again, it's a similar kind of setup as to what we had before. Except we have the quaternion algebra over Q adjoined root minus three. And the ramification set here is at two finite places. And again, to emphasize, this distinguishes kind of the local behavior or the bounded representations from the matrix algebra because we're ramified. So we see a division algebra locally at these two places. And that's sort of different behavior locally from the other bounded representations that you would see from the matrix algebras over those fields. And then maybe one final example that I'll mention that is recently been done by my student, Tam Cheatham West. And this is interesting because this is a, an example of a fibered hyperbolic three manifold that is Galois rigid. So even though there's a map to Z from the fundamental group, and so there are lots of representations in the PSL2C, they're all abelian, this guy is Galois rigid. The only things that are the risky dense come from the faithful discrete and his Galois closure. And so he's able to run the machine to prove that in fact, um, this fundamental group of this fiber three manifold is uh, profinitely rigid. And it uses crucially some information that um, Martin, Ben, Ryan, and myself did about 
in the proof that um, the Weeks manifold was profinitely rigid in an original paper using this congruent subgroup level of prime of norm 23. Anyway, I'm not going to sort of dwell much more on that. Okay, so let me get to the stuff that Alex has been waiting for. Um, so here's the end game summary. So full size is, an, is the notion, notion that Martin mentioned. It just means that there's a free non-abelian subgroup. And so in the original paper with Martin, Ben, Ryan, and myself, to prove profinitely rigid, the representation rigidity stuff was kind of uniform, but then it was kind of ad hoc, dropping around in the bushes kind of arguments to kind of prove that the groups that we could profi be profinitely rigid were profinitely rigid. They were very ad hoc. There was no structure to them, very much dependent on various coincidences and understanding subgroup structure of these groups. Now Martin and I have developed a, a much cleaner version of what the end game looks like. And so the key takeaway here is that whenever you've got a homomorphism back to the Kleinian group, whose image is a proper subgroup of finite index in gamma, then they can't have the same profinite completions. Okay, so if you can get the representation rigidity stuff to work and you can get back into where you started and you know it's finite index, but as we've seen, that happens fairly naturally in some examples, then one can prove profinite rigidity. Okay, so as I said in the remark, this, is, this, this has finite index in the assumption, so we do have to deal with infinite index. But as I mentioned before, in many examples, it's quite straightforward. And in fact, all the examples that we can currently do is, it is just really the argument I mentioned. Okay, so how does this end game work? So let's, let's just um, maybe sketch the proof of the following thing, that in fact, we're gonna be more explicit than what I said previously, that if you've got a proper subgroup of finite index, then this guy has a finite quotient that the original group gamma does not. Okay, so that means that, you know, gamma and H can't have the same profinite completions because I've exhibited to you a finite quotient that, that, of H that gamma doesn't have. Now, of course, like all of this game, we're never, ever, ever going to exhibit a finite quotient of H that's not a finite quotient of gamma. We somehow have to sort of sneak up on it. And the sneaking up is done using sort of things that are quite cute, but in some sense are, you know, fairly well known, I think, except they haven't maybe be packaged together in the way that Martin and I did, together with some crucial input of our recent understanding of profinite rigidity among hyperbolic manifolds. So the first thing is, as Martin mentioned, there's this nice way of interpreting same profinite completion, if and only if same finite quotients. Well, the first statement here is really just a one-sided version of that. That if you know that every finite quotient of H is also a finite quotient of G, then you can get this continuous surjection from G hat to H hat. The second thing is that there's this old result of Hirschhorn in the discrete case, that's basically the statement in the discrete case and assuming residual finiteness, that if we've got a finitely generated profinite group in a subgroup H of finite index, then every epimorphism from alpha, sorry, alpha from G to H has finite kernel. So in particular, if you know that the profinite group has no finite normal subgroup, then alpha would be injective. And so you would get isomorphism. Now, again, in our setting, the no finite normal subgroup part is actually a consequence, and again, I don't know how to do this without using something that uses goodness of these hyperbolic three manifolds. It's a consequence of the work of Egel and Wise. And again, getting back to what Martin was emphasizing at the start, the virtual special cube complex machine, that this builds in goodness as a consequence of this. And in particular, for three manifolds of finite volume, Egel wise proved virtual fibering, and then it's in Serre's Galois cohomology group that that's enough to give you goodness. So this is this is important use of the technology. Can you remind us what goodness was? I forgot. Yeah, so goodness is the following, Peter. So we, we have a, a map from gamma into its profinite completion. We can take the continuous cohomology of the profinite completion with finite module coefficients. And if we look at the induced map, of the continuous cohomology of the profinite guy with the finite module coefficients to the discrete group cohomology guy, 
If that's an isomorphism for all Q, then the group is called good. And to prove that in this Kleinian setting, uh, right. you, what, what of Eagle and Y? Are you just using the finite index positive Betty number or more? You need more than that. So once you know it's virtually fibered, so you get a short exact sequence from the three manifold group to Z with kernel a surface group. Then in fact, you know, Z is good, surface groups are good, and then it's an exercise in Serge's book on Galois cohomology to prove that in fact the middle group is good. Oh, and okay. so therefore you get goodness of the bundle. So and then goodness is preserved by commensurability. Okay. That's another kind of well-known fact. And, and that's how it all fits together. I mean, you don't need virtual fibering to get goodness. Um, you can use this special cube complex machine and, hi and hierarchies to get that. Still, still missing something, uh, even with the goodness. Why, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know that the group G does not have a finite normal sum group, but uh, uh, the, the Klein and group, but why not its for finite completion? Even right, so, so, so think about this case, Alex. Suppose the guy's torsion free, we've got this hyperbolic three manifold. Yeah, Dimension. Right, exactly. But then, but then that's kind of the argument in general, right? I mean, because you now know that you know the guy is good. Any Kleinian group of finite covolume is good, and so you know that's enough to rule out finite normal subgroup anyway. Why? 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 Because it's it's only virtual finite cohomological dimension, so. I mean, somehow I, so you, can, you can show that. Well, so so way the way to say it is that you know if you have this finite index, if you have this finite normal subgroup, then it, it's known that um, the torsion has to show up in the Kleinian group. I mean, so that's a theorem. That is a normal sum. Why is a normal sum? That's it, what I mean. So so you inter so you intersect the Kleinian group with this normal subgroup, right? So I'm, I'm not saying this cleanly, but, but the point is that, that any torsion that shows up in this finite normal subgroup in the profinite guy has to show up in the, in the Kleinian group. We can talk about it afterwards, but it, it's, a, it's a true statement. No, the torsion I see, but not as a normal subgroup. That's the problem. Maybe, maybe I mean, I don't see counterexample, but why, why a torsion? Let's say that the example is an yeah. element Here's a, here's, a more, here's a more simple here's a more simple minded argument for you then Alec. How about this? So we know that these hyperbolic three manifold groups they surject infinitely many finite simple groups of the form PSL two FP. And so if there's a finite normal subgroup, and we know that the kernels of these guys are torsion free, which they are for all but finitely many primes P, then the finite normal subgroup would have to be killed under these homomorphisms to PSL2F. And so therefore they would lie in the kernel of the homomorphism to PSL2F, which is torsion free, but those guys are good and we've just agreed that these guys don't have any torsion in the profinite completion. Happy now? Okay. Okay, so, this, so maybe I won't dwell too much on the sketch proof, but it goes as you would think it goes. You assume that there, you know, you do have the same finite quotients. You put one and two together from the previous slide, and you get an isomorphism using goodness of the profinite completions. And then you just repeat this. And then you get the sequence of Kleinian groups whose indices are going to infinity with the same profinite completion. But a crucial piece of new information from 2020 is a result of Yi Liu that proves there's only finitely many finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds whose fundamental groups have the same profinite completion. And so that's a contradiction, at least in the case when it's torsion three. So this is just amongst hyperbolic three manifolds of finite volume. So the assumption is you just look at this class of hyperbolic three manifolds of finite volume with the same profinite completion. He proves that's a finite set. Uh, does he have an example that it's more than one? No, 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 no. 
So the conjecture is still, is still that it's, they are all virtually, that they are all finite rigid. And that, that's the conjecture in my office. I, I can't speak for other people's offices, but certainly that's my conjecture. But again, to emphasize, it uses a virtual fibering machine that Eagle and Wise did to prove this particular statement. So let me just point out that this completes the proof in the case of the Weeks manifold and the other example M4, because we've now, we've reduced it to the finite index case. Well, I've just proved to you that in fact, you know, the subgroup of finite index and the original guy can't have the same finite quotients. So therefore the Weeks manifold is profinitely rigid. Now you may ask, well, what about the infinite index case? Well, actually this is quite straightforward. I mean, if you have a case where these two guys are the same profile completion, well, it's known that the first L2 Betty number is, a first, is a, an invariant of the profile completion. So two groups with the same profile completion of the same first L2 Betty number, but for infinite index guys, the first L2 Betty number is known zero by a result of Lawton and Luke. It's just like Euler characteristic in the case of kind of surface groups, but the first L2 Betty number of a lattice is zero. And so you can't have that um, in the case of, of this case. So this is kind of an easy case to, to clean up. And it's maybe worth remarking that, you know, higher L2 Betty numbers are not profinite invariants. There's some nice work by Holger Kammer, Stefan Kionki, Jean Rambeau, and Roman Sauer that give construction of higher, higher L2 Betty numbers that are different under profinite completion. So for example, some of Aka's examples. And then maybe the end game for the Fuchsian groups, and again, it's a similar kind of idea to the previous one for finite index um, guys. It's just a statement about L2 Betty numbers and how they grew on finite sheeted covering spaces. So in the finite index case, you know, the L2 Betty number is related by scales by the, the index. The first L2 Betty number of these Fuchsian groups are known zero. And so that's the way that we rule out finite index case. And then let me say how one deals with infinite index case. And in fact, it's something that was Ben mentioned in passing that in fact, one can kind of exploit the fact that whenever you've got positive dimensional character varieties in PSL2C, you can build lots of finite representations inside groups of the form PSL2F or F's a finite field so that the original guy can't have these finite quotients. So these triangle groups have very limited representation theory into PSL2F P bar. You can only have finitely many. But once you've got positive dimensional character varieties, you can build infinitely many. And basically, you can use that to rule out infinite index subgroups because the infinite index subgroups of triangle groups have positive dimensional character varieties. And again, this also applies to the case of PSL2 of Z adjoin omega to rule out infinite index case there. You can build finite quotients of infinite index subgroups that um, PS that infinite index subgroups with finite quotients that the Bianchi group cannot have. Okay, so there was some three manifold stuff there, but I, I think time is ticking on and I, I won't sort of bore you with any of that. It's not boring, of course, to me, but maybe, maybe to some of the audience, it's maybe less exciting, but maybe just mention that with work with... Just to, uh, uh, matters of which you know where we stand now. As of now, you, you have another work which you show that I, I believe that among the Fuchsian groups, you know, it's impossible that two different Fuchsian groups will have the same core final completion. That's, That's correct. Right. And, 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 but with Kleinian groups, do you know something like that or you don't know? No, what, all that we know is really what Yi Liu tells us that there's finitely many with the same profile completion. So good, we do know. So if you look at this result of Wilton and Zaleski, it, kind of, it does say that if you've got some three manifold group with the same profile completion as a hyperbolic three manifold group, then that guy is also hyperbolic. And so then you use Liu to say, well, there's only finitely many possibilities for those hyperbolic manifolds. Um, so in more recent work with Martin and Ryan, we've proved that- um, Just a moment, in the previous slides, you showed example, what, what is- uh, none of, uh, T2 bundle, I say not hyperbolic. There, there are examples right. of many folds with this, different right. with the same, but not hyperbolic, okay. 
Right, so there's these torus bundles over the circle and there are these Zypher fiber spaces, which are circle bundles over surfaces. But these are very close in spirit to the examples that Martin described at the start due to bounce lag. It's a very similar kind of proof. That was kind of the idea of this slide, but I'm not gonna dwell on that because time is ticking by. But just to say that we can kind of analyze those Zypher fiber spaces whose bases are, are spheres with cone points that arise from the triangle groups that we can prove are profinitely rigid. So we can completely analyze and prove that most of these Zypher groups are themselves profinitely rigid. And then we can go beyond that and maybe just finish here that, as Martin said in his talk, that you can build these Groton deep pairs using F2 times F2. But, you know, we believe in a good reason to trust Martin's judgment in this, but amongst finitely presented guys, you know, F2 times F2 would be profinitely rigid. But the Groton deep construction gives examples of finitely generated groups with the same profinite completion. But in fact, we can use these Zypher fiber spaces to, to construct these examples that are provably profinitely rigid amongst finitely presented groups, but not amongst finitely generated ones. Now, this does need the, the three manifold group for various reasons, and not just the triangle groups. Now, the good news is I've got a perfect sketch of a proof for this theorem that I'm sure you're going to like, given the time of the day. And there is a sketch of the proof. Uh, we're still kind of writing down all the details of that, but um, that's the spirit of, of, of the proof here. And with that, I'll, I'll thank you and just advertise a conference that some of this ideas will be talked about, arithmetic groups and three manifolds at Max Planck in Bonn in May of this year, God willing in person, at least for some people, um, details to be soon. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a much. question. What happens, so you talk about quaternion algebras, what about a quaternion algebra that is ramified at the Archimedean place, like the Hamilton quaternions, and then you get the free group by taking an S arithmetic group at one place. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, are there any examples there that you know uh, of? It just, it just seems like uh, the SL2C of SL2R, and these would be into a compact group. But this would just be free, would they just be free groups, Peter? No, 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 no. The free would be if you just have one place. Uh-huh. So SL2 Z1 over P, we don't know that's proof on it, we reject. Yeah, okay. for, the same, for the same reason as SL3Z, you could run the same argument and then it's reduced to Grotendieck pair for SL2 Z1 over P. SL2 Z1 over P, you can really reduce it uh, I couldn't hear you, Alex. Could you speak up? I mean, in S, if gamma is SL two Z one, then in, uh, that's that's kind of thing. I I knew for a while uh, we, without such sophisticated machinery, you can reduce it to the Gordon D problem, and it's so tempting that once you reduce it, because the structure of this group, you know, yeah. it's sort of with amalgam, but I I could not handle this. I mean, I, it might be that uh, even in, that in that group, every subgroup of infinite index, which is Zaritsky dense, must, is, is virtually free, but I don't know that. I mean, it's amazing. No, surf, there are surface groups in there, so maybe they're so virtually. To Z1 over P, you have surface groups? Yeah, there are surface groups there. Oh, I didn't know. Even this I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Um, I was, I had one question. I, I was looking at your proof of this Galois rigidity for these particular groups. Um, it didn't, it seemed like the proof would work just as well if you replaced the complex numbers by say the completion of the algebraic closure of QP. I mean, is there any right. constant rigidity in that sense? No, I mean, it's, it's exactly as you say, Ted. In, in fact, you know, maybe there's more mileage in the FP bar setting rather than the QP bar setting. I mean, that's really just the same as kind of Galois rigidity as we were talking about. But the, the fact that you have this kind of structure showing up in PSL to FP bar representations as well, you know, all these finite quotients of like 334 that are PSL to F are all controlled by number theory. Same as like 237, all the finite quotients are controlled by the splitting type of primes. And that's kind of done really by a Galois rigidity argument in PSL to FP bar.
Some more questions? If not, then uh, thank you both of you, uh, and in fact, the four of you for this uh, excellent uh, sequence of talks. And next week we have um, uh, Lee, um, uh, Mintu Lee will, will speak, and we have also a program for the next few weeks, but I, we will, uh, we will put it on the website soon. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank you all.